Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live, and we have a very special guest tonight, Amanda Wiss, whose resume is too long to recite right now. Amanda, how are you doing? And thank you for being with us. I'm doing well, and thank you for having me. Oh, it is my pleasure. It is my pleasure. Uh, let's just get started. You have uh, such a successful career that encompasses so many memorable, now classic movies your prof your first professional credit is like sometime around the age of 20 just tell us what when did you know that you wanted acting to be your career well um i i my older sister um was doing a play and i went to see her play and i was 11 and that's really when I went, oh, wow, this is amazing. And so that theater here in Los Angeles, the following year did um, The Innocents. Um, and they, I got to play the little girl, Flora, in that. It's a really good, uh, beautiful play. And then the following year, I did The Bad Seed, playing Rhoda at mm -hmm. the same theater. And then from there, I got an agent, so I was 12 and um, started doing commercials. So wow. did a lot of commercials and voiceovers. And then um, when I was, yeah, when I was still a teenager, actually, I got uh, my first guest star uh, that I'd ever read for, because I didn't read for those during, while I was in high school. Um, I got Buck Rogers in the <laughs> 25th century, which was really fun and I, wore like a really bizarre little toga outfit and then <laughs> i think all my lines were i love you buck rogers and so um i was laura the wood nymph mm -hmm. then from there i just started doing tv movies and um lots of episodics a ton of pilots that didn't go to tv series mm -hmm. much to my heartbreak and um and then when i was still maybe by 20 i got I was in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And we're actually going to get to that right now yeah. because... So that's kind of the sequence of things. But so I kind of knew from theater. And then after high school, I went to drama school and, and studied stage. And yeah. But then ended up not... I've only done one professional play, which was amazing because it was with Eva Marie Saint. Um, but... It, it, it just goes to show you that, you know theater school, workshops, it's good. It's a good tool to have, but sometimes it's not necessary. So let's go to what is uh, your first feature film that's not a uh, made-for-TV movie or a TV series, and that is Fast Times at Ridgemont High, correct? Actually, there's I, I forgot one, and it's, it's not a very good movie, um, but it's called Force 5. And it was directed by it was directed by um, oh my gosh I think I'm forgetting his name Robert Klaus who directed Enter the Dragon yeah so I was super excited I was still a teenager it might have been like just the summer after high school and um, it it was bad and it, another outfit that I basically was in a sheet shaped like a cult thing like a little robe I was like what is it with people dressing me in sheets whether it be a toga or a cult robe so I did that one and then I did fast times all right so fast times you got the script you audition at the time did you think this was going to be anything more than just another 80s teen movie that might have its little bit of a heyday but just over time fade in the background which it hasn't been and it's become a classic yeah N i didn't think those things only because um i was so young and naive i think i thought everything was gonna be <laughs> big but it was also that they had they were really like when i went and met with amy heckerling who is she's a goddess i'm mm -hmm. i love her so much um you know, they were, everybody was already talking that it was kind of the new American graffiti. Plus, it was a huge studio film. It was done, it, it was, you know, a, a big studio film. So, I mean, I thought it had a, 
a chance, you know, I mean, ever, ever hopeful. So I, I kind of, and the script was so good that you kind of just thought, wow, th th hopefully this won't go wrong because the script is so good. And the cast. Oh, my God. I mean, talk about an all-star lineup. It, you know what's amazing about that, the cast of that film is that every single person in it either went on to be a huge star, a character actress like me, or left the business and are hugely successful. Yeah. So it, there's literally every single person um, in it, you know, it, you know, it got, you know, a bit of blessing from that. I mean, yeah. you're talking about Sean Penn, Phoebe Cates, the list just goes on and on. Now, yeah, it just, it's crazy. Now, looking back on it, uh, <clears throat> 40 years later, uh, and the impact it's still having, do people still approach you about fast times? Um, you know, when people, <clears throat> yeah, in some ways, like if I'm at a Comic-Con or something, people there's people just love that film and now it's like the third generation of people watching it mm -hmm. um uh, and if you know just randomly somebody will say oh my god i heard you were in that movie i love that movie so much so yeah i mean it's not like people recognize me from it but it's if when they know i'm in it people are you know they i love to hear the stories because people um you know really loved that film and it's fun to hear now, looking back, you know, uh, after all this time and reflecting on the role of Lisa that you played at Ridgemont, yeah. uh, what impact do you think that had on your career back then? Well, I mean, I think it did a little bit in the sense that, you know, I was young and I had really big agents at the time and, uh, you know that it helped kind of create a little bit of momentum but mostly that momentum went back into television for me that's when i started doing a lot of tv pilots and tv movies and mm -hmm. i think right after that i did um one of the highest rated tv movies ever at the time anyway uh with lonnie anderson called my mother's secret life and things like that that i probably that that movie had helped you know yeah. make now we're gonna get to nightmare on elm street in a second but I want to jump ahead a little bit. In 85, you played Beth in, uh, Beth in Better Off Dead. I yeah. love that movie, you know, with John Cusack. Um, your character played the typical 80s popular high school girl who was <laughs> dating the popular high school guy. And you were the girl that John Cusack was pining over the whole movie till the very end. Uh, looking back on Better Off Dead... It doesn't quite have the following of like Fast Times at Richmond High or even Nightmare on Elm Street, but that was a great movie and it still has a loyal fan base to today. What was your experience like working on Better Off Dead? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, first I wanted to address a couple things you said. One of the reasons that it it doesn't have quite the same, I mean, although the fans of Better Off Dead are huge. Um, it's, it, it's, it's impossible to see. It doesn't yeah. stream. Um, it's not on demand. Um, somewhere in the shuffles of studios selling each other. That's it's a shame. Got lost in a vault somewhere. Um, so I think that because the, the impact of like other films from that era, you know, is that they're streaming constantly and, and they're just, people have more access to it. But um, the, the fun thing about doing that movie was in the same like nine months I did Nightmare on Elm Street at the end of summer I did Better Off Dead from fall and then that Jan then the next January I left to do Silverado so it was it was a pretty big spree but um Better Off Dead we're all still friends it was so much fun all we did was laugh um, and we'd go at night and do, um, there was a, we, we were shooting at this resort in Utah and, uh, we were like kind of the only people there. And so we, there was a place called the tram bar. We'd go, we'd have our dinner, we'd dance all night and then we'd wake up in the morning and just laugh all day. And, um, Curtis Armstrong and John and Aaron Dozier, the three guys were mm -hmm. so flipping funny together 
constantly. Like we, we were like in tears laughing the entire time, which by the way, rarely ever happens where you have, where you're laughing all the time on a set. It's usually tens and people are fighting. Um, that's not true, but um, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And I, I just love that movie. It's such a fun movie. Now, you know, you said Fast Times was a big studio film. What was, was Better Off Dead the same or was that a smaller scale? It was a little bit smaller scale, but it was still a studio film. Um, uh, so it had it had a lot of you know people you know it had it had a lot of people behind it. Um, so yeah, it was it wasn't a little indie by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. And um, uh, but yeah, it's, but it's just gotten lost in the shuffle. In fact, I, I asked the director, uh, Savage Steve, who I love. And now I can't remember what he told me because it, it's like it's. It gets mixed. Yeah, I, I tell you with the legal rights, it's just, it's a shame in my mind that it is lost in the shuffle, and today's generation doesn't have access to it, uh, right. such as as other movies, because right. I'm sure if access to it was available as some other '80s films, it yeah. would regain a whole new generation of followers. I think so. At, at Comic Cons, when people come up, because they tend to come up for uh, Better Off Dead. Fast Times, Nightmare, and then um, The Highlander, because I was on that series. Mm -hmm. And the, the people that own Better Off Dead, you know, the DVD of it or whatever, like, they're on, they, they've passed it down, like, from people my age to their kids to their kids. And it's it's really extraordinary. And people love it. And they're, they're like, I, my kid's finally old enough to see this movie. And um, so I love it. I, yeah. I mean, it, it's just people have such great stories especially better off dead like families seem to watch that mm -hmm. Christmas time together and it's kind of neat to know that you're a part of people's celebration and you know that you know uh the 80s is sort of repeating itself today especially when it comes to like fashion the 80s style is back in fashion oh, uh in my it is in my opinion uh a movie like better off dead would be very relevant in today's world about what high schoolers have to deal with. Do you agree with that? I do. I think fast times is still relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, yeah, I do. I think, I think better off dead really in, in a way without social media, it was pre cell phones and all that, obviously, yeah. but how hard it is to grow up, how hard it is to be a teen, how hard it is, you know, to find yourself uh, and and build your self confidence and all those things when things aren't. Oh, you froze. You still there? Okay, we lost you there for a second. We got you back. Oh, okay, no, Savage no. Steve Holland is a genius. Yes. Yeah, I love. I love. He just wrote a great script. And it was. It was a great script, and I'm going to say it again. It's a shame that that movie is lost somewhere in the vault and it's not being distributed today. Now, looking at your resume, I mean, like you said, in the 80s, it was like one role after the other. You are a really hot commodity. Being so young, uh, how did, I mean, did that put you in uh i'm trying to find the right word give you a false sense of security maybe that it's always going to be that way not that it wasn't you went on to have a very successful career but man in the 80s it's just one thing after the other for you yeah i do think that there was a part of me that thought this is great like this is this is you know this is how it's always going to be which it wasn't i've had some really lean um, years as far as getting the roles I wanted or, you know, or I go through a streak where I test for a million things and don't get any of them. <laughs> and, and it's always cyclical, but yes, I, I was a little bit, um, where other friends of mine were struggling and things were just really happening for me. I really, yeah, I thought that not in an arrogant way, but I thought, Oh, I've built this and it will sustain itself. But, yeah. um, the business is mercurial and it yeah. doesn't always work out that way. Exactly, exactly. So you get casted as Tina on Nightmare on Elf Street. Uh, tell us, how did the role of Tina come your way? Did your agent just, you know, tell you to audition, get you the script? How did it come your way? 
Um, yes, I was sent the script by my agent and um, all the girls read for the role of Nancy. Mm -hmm. And so I read the script and I hadn't really ever seen a horror film or anything. I just, I, not for any reason other than they just weren't around me. And, um, um, and I'd seen some old black and white ones, but I'd read a lot of horror books. Mm -hmm. I really liked reading it. But anyway, so I went and met with Wes Craven, who was lovely, and we talked about horror, you know, novels that we'd both read and stuff. Because the script for Nightmare on Elm Street, I remember telling him, Wes, that I thought it read like a really good horror novel because it, it was just written so beautifully. He's such a good storyteller mm -hmm. and um, really understood that age group that he was writing for because he had daughters that mm -hmm. age. And um, and so I read for Nancy and then I get a call back and it's for Tina. And I'm like, wait, what? And so I go back in for my call back and it was Heather, Johnny, Nick, and me and he had us all just read together and then told us that we had the part in the room which never happens <laughs> yeah that's the first time i ever heard that yeah so he just kind of knew like he had gone through the tapes and i don't know maybe he watched them with his kids or i'm not even sure he just like was really sure about what he was looking for in um in it, you know in the characters and i i think it was it was, it was also so well done in the sense that, um, I don't know. He picked really good chemistry. We all got along. It was the same with um, Better Off Dead. That like yeah. chemistry, because you know you can. There's often times when you're doing a movie or a TV show and you just don't have chemistry, and you're like, that's when your acting um, school comes in handy, where you can manufacture it. But um, yeah, so we. He just told us we all got the part and I was really excited. I, I didn't really know much about horror. And I remember telling Wes, I was like, I don't know, like, is it different if to do a horror movie? And he's like, no, don't. No. Yeah, I just want you to be, you know, do the things. Because he had seen me in a couple TV movies. And he was like, just do what you do and, and I'll do the scary stuff. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, now, now, Wes Craven, by the time Nightmare, he was pretty established uh, starting from the 70s. Did you know about Wes Craven when you were going into Nightmare on Elm Street and some of his prior projects? No, I didn't because I had never really seen modern horror movies before. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know anything about him, honestly. And... Um, or or anyone in the current horror or the modern horror world. I mean, I knew old, like, Vincent, you know, like, Bela Lugosi movies and <laughs> Vincent Price and stuff like that. Um, so I got to just have a relationship with Wes, just fresh, just as an actor and a director, because I was just excited. He was so kind and funny. And, and maybe that helped. I, I bet you that kind of helped, and the intimidation factor wasn't there for you. It wasn't at all because I was just like, we're making a heart. I don't know. Like I didn't, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. And I knew as soon as I was done with that, I, I'd already been cast in better off dead. So I, I was also kind of half thinking about like, Oh my gosh, I need to finish this. And then I have like a week to get to Utah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I was like, right. So now uh, a lot of people have forgotten that Johnny Depp was in a Nightmare on Elm Street. That's just one of, uh, no, yeah, <laughs> John, uh, you know, new actor. Uh, is it true, uh, you know, like you and Heather l became friends on the set and remained friends for a while after? We're still great friends. She's awesome. one of my closest friends and has been since we made the movie. Um, yeah, and and, and I was, we're we're all still friendly. Obviously, Johnny isn't he isn't here a lot of the mm -hmm. time, and 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 Nick has or now he goes by Jesu has gone on to you know he's more of like a director now mm -hmm. and doing all kinds of things. And um, but yeah, we all we all really like each other. But Heather and I have stayed. We're in fact, I'm seeing her on Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, looking back on all the films you did back then and all the great. Uh, actors, including yourself, that they got to work with you and you got to work with them. 
uh, you're like, wow, look at these people and what they did afterwards and the, the honor and the pleasure that I had working with them. Do you, do you ever think that? Like, you know, like, look at all these people that I had a chance to work with when they were getting started. Oh, my gosh. Even now, um, yeah, there's, there's like a couple, I mean, just so many big standouts, especially like I got to do a TV movie with Robert Mitchum. And I was so intimidated and scared. And he was the nicest person to me. And, you know, even Marie Saint. I mean, I just like sat there and was like, tell me everything about Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> Think about yourself. I want to know every story from on the waterfront. And, um, oh my God, there's so many. I, I'm, I, I always count my lucky stars yeah. and feel really grateful that my hat is still in this game and that I still occasionally get a role that I love and, um, and that, I get to work with talented creators and, um, but yeah, always I'm, you know, and yeah, there's just so many people that it's just, um, and I got to meet like some of my like teen idols. Like I got to, um, work with Sean Cassidy wow. and I got yeah. to meet. That's a Don blast Johnson. from the past. huh? <laughs> so I was like, so when I was younger, I was like, Oh my God, this is so exciting. I cannot believe I am here with Sean Cassidy. So You're here both. you guys, you Heather, Johnny, the rest of the night. When did, when do you recall was the first time you met Robert, Robert England? The first time I met him was in the makeup trailer and he would get there so much earlier than the rest of us because his makeup application took I think, uh, five hours every day. I can imagine. He was such a trooper. Um, but I had seen him in things like V. V, but also he was in one of my all time favorite movies called big Wednesday about the, the surfers in the seventies and, um, and, and V, um, and you know, and, um, Oh my God, he was in so many great films. Um, and he he also has a love for the theater. Um, but he, so I walked into the makeup trailer and he was sort of half made up and he's like, ah, I'm Robert, cause he's so, um, he's very chatty and, and he's a great raconteur and always has a story on hand to tell. And, um, and I think we all kind of hung out in the makeup trailer watching him get his makeup done. Um, we didn't wear very much makeup. We were, you know, kids and they yeah. threw a, powder on us and some, some like Carmex on our lips and like called it a day. So we would just hang out with him in the makeup trailer and he listened to his stories. Um, he had so many great stories. Now, uh, I'm really curious, how long did shooting Nightmare take from principal photography to the end? I think it was only like six weeks. It was a very wow. brief shoot um, and it was so low budget. I mean, I there there was a couple times where the plug almost got pulled before we were even done. Um, there were days when the, Heather, Johnny and I all wore the same size Levi's. And there was, I, there were some days where there just was only two pair. And so like, thank God they do. Like there was very low budget. Um, and, um, uh, so it was a really fast shoot and I was only there for, maybe three weeks of the mm -hmm. shoot. Um, and so I was there obviously. And then I left and then I came back the very last day to, you know, have, yeah. have a toast with everybody. Cause it, we, you know, rap it, party. Yeah. And it was also like, it was, it was a really fun adventure and it was exciting and I wanted to be there the last day um, to commemorate it because yeah. it was, it was fun and exciting. And, and cause I bet you're going to ask this. I did not know it was going to be a classic or a success or anything. I, I think partly cause I didn't know the horror world. So I didn't have anything to base it on. And well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. When you read the script, you got the part was there any part of you that thought, man, doing a horror movie might have a negative impact on my career? I did it against my agent's wishes. Wow. Everybody that represented me, the entire team, was against me doing the movie. Well, I'm Just, glad you didn't listen to them. 
I did not listen to them. And it was partly because of my meeting with Wes. I just really liked him. And I just thought I, I wanted to learn from him and I wanted to be around him. And, um, and I thought he was such a great storyteller. I wanted to get to help tell that story in my own way, you know, in, in, yeah. you know and the, that just sheds a light on back, you know, in the 80s on what the industry really thought about horror yeah. and how, you know, agents, managers, publicists were trying to protect their clients from what they thought was taking a wrong turn in their career. I agree. Do you feel looking at today and where horror stands today and how it's with, you know, withstood the test of time that has done a complete 180? Well, I do. I mean, now it's like major, like, you know, all the, any good role that I would want to play in a horror film is now being played by like a, a triple A list movie star. Yeah. So you go, Oh, okay. So everybody just knows where the money is now. I, I don't know that they have a love for it, but they, they certainly know it's a lucrative thing to be in that keeps I think it keeps actors relevant and, you know, studios are making a ton of money off of everybody, yeah. off the work of all the horror people it's, up until now. It's one of the top genres right now. I believe it's at its at its height. Now, Tina, your character on Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, I believe is Freddy Krueger's first on screen kill. Did you know that? Do you want to know? I did not even ever put that together till I was at a comic con and somebody's like, what's it like being Freddie's first victim? And I, I was, Oh, I guess I am yeah. well, I, like, well, the best went first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all know how this franchise has become, you know, to call it a hit would be an understatement. It's become a classic would be an understatement. Uh, looking back, uh, how does it feel to have that distinction, uh, being Freddy Krueger's first on-screen victim? Well, I don't really think about it like that, really. But I, I do think about how lucky and blessed I am that I'm in such an... I got to be a part of such an iconic story that people love so much. And um, that somebody was saying about the first victim, Freddie's first victim. And I was like, well, technically I'm the first person to fight Freddie. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Tina did that she literally fought him for 14 minutes. And yeah. that's gotta be the longest fight scene ever in a movie. And, um, but it was neat. Like there's cool things have happened. Like there was a picture of Wes and I hanging of Wes and me hanging in the director's guild in Los Angeles in the lobby, this huge thing of us for years. It was amazing. And that's just amazing. And then the other thing was Robert told me that he was at the, not the Venice, maybe it was the Venice film festival. It was some big film festival. And there was a huge poster of me in the body bag. Yeah. Like it was like three stories tall randomly there like the movie wasn't and it's and robert was like guess where you were and sent me a picture i'm like oh my gosh well i finally made it to the venice film festival <laughs> <laughs> so filming is done now it comes time for the release uh what were your emotions when this thing was about to hit the theaters i mean i was excited for it like i couldn't wait to see it and this is a true story and it's funny is that I was late to the cast and crew screening and the fire marshal wouldn't let me in because it was too crowded. And I'm like, but I'm in the, and he's like, sorry, you can't come in. Oh man. And then I went to Westwood to see it opening weekend and it was sold out. And then I went the next night and it was sold out and I finally went, screw it. I'm never going to see this movie on it, on the thing. And I, I, so I didn't actually, I didn't see it until West gave me a VHS copy of it. Oh my God. That's a shame you didn't get to see it for the first time in the theater. Now, at which point did you realize that this thing was on a trajectory that nobody guessed? It was about a year or so after it went out on VHS. Um, there were things, sorry, there's like, seemed, appears to be a dog fight outside my window. Um, 
that uh, I know this is when I knew I was at my mom's house in Manhattan Beach handing out Halloween candy and there every third kid was a Freddy Krueger and I was like what and so when some old some kids teenagers came to the door and they were dressed like Freddy Krueger I was like I'm in that movie and they were like no you're not <laughs> I, was like, oh. I was like no I play Tina and they're like no you don't no <laughs> They didn't believe me, and I was like, oh. but um, that's when I knew, and I felt like that was like when you saw so many kids and teens dressed like Freddy Krueger. I mean, I went, oh, this is like an iconic monster. Yeah, that- I mean, in 84, you already had Michael Myers, and then, of course, Jason and Freddy joined those two, which was, yeah. you know, a thing. And still today, it's Freddy, Jason, and Michael the three biggest right. slashers of all time now that body bag scene um i mean your death scene a nightmare and that body bag scene how much time tell us how the the filming sequence went of you being in that body bag and how did you make you feel personally i hope you're not claustrophobic i'm totally claustrophobic um it was it was it it was really terrifying. I mean, but in, you know, in the respect that we're making a movie, not terrifying, like I'm doing something heroic or something, but, um, you know, it was a low budget. So it was a real body bag. So there was no like inside zipper or anything. And they just like poked a few pinholes in it. And then Wes would be like, hold your breath. And I was like, Oh my God. And I was like, (laughs) Who's going to let me out of this if I panic? And I know. They were, oh, there's, you know, whatever, George in the corner. or he, He'll, he, you know, just yell. He'll come get you. So I felt really trapped, and it was very difficult to breathe through little pinholes in a really thick plastic body bag. Oh. So I was – I just wanted it over. But Wes had made a joke, like – when I would walk on set, he'd be like, "Guess what? Ha- what? Guess what? I'm making you do today?" Because there would be days. I some of the things didn't even end up in the final cut, but I'd pick up a handful of worms, or I'd, uh, you know, uh, go in the body bag, or I had to stand in eels. Oh. Um, I had to like get a plastic cast on my face so they could do the centipede thing and so there was a lot of things so he was he was like and today's the body bag <laughs> so, you know and then they like spray you down with sticky blood and all kind of you know oil to make it gl- it was just so like ew oh my god i can imagine yeah. now your your death <laughs> scene on elm street with the whole rotating room and that whole contraption uh what was that like well you know it was very disorienting and ha- and halfway through i i no longer could tell which way was up or down i got you know vertigo i guess to some degree and because everything in that room was like nailed down and glued so when it when the cuz it so it was like a box built in a sound stage and literally like people were outside cranking mm-hmm. it around um so i was always on the ground but there would be times I'd look up and there was the bed above me. And then all the, I just thought I was falling and I actually panicked and started screaming at some one point and they had to cut and Wes came in and stuck his head through the window and he's like, see, you're on the ground. I'm standing. And um, so he started to talk to me and then he went and I'd already been in the room for like a half hour while it was going around. And he all of a sudden stopped and went, Oh my God, this is awful. I'm so disoriented. I can't believe I'm doing this to this girl. <laughs> so like he goes back out and, and we practiced it a lot because it was low budget. There was only one room. We're putting this staining blood stuff. I mean, I think that there's better blood now <laughs> than there was back then. Um, so we couldn't really make any mistakes. Like mm-hmm. I had to make it look like I was being dragged and we really worked on my athletic ability to make that happen. And, you know, and, and how to fall into each corner. And because it, once we got blood on the walls, we kind of had to just keep going. Keep and so going. we, so it was a lot of pressure for me because 
I was just like, all right, this is where all my training comes in. You know, I, we've rehearsed it. I know it was like, it was like choreographing a dance routine really. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. And, um, when we were done, I felt like we'd made something really cool. Like when I got out of the room and was able to get my bearings again, like I just went, I can, and the the crew, everybody was really silent. Mm -hmm. it just you know, like when people go, oh, that was that was eerie or terrifying or or something. So, I felt really proud of the work that Wes helped me do. Yeah, and that's my next question. Uh, considering how low budget Nightmare on Elm Street was, were you impressed with Wes's innovation to come up with something like that? Very much so. And he was like that with everything. I think in, in all of his films, although I obviously went on to do bigger budgeted films yeah. after that. Um, I, I think partly he's so smart. I mean, he was a professor and he, you know, a writer and he's so smart and well-spoken that I just think he was so smart. His ability to problem solve and create um was you know un unparalleled in in many ways and so yeah i think it was impressive and 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 then also you know with bob shea was such a we're gonna get this done we're gonna make this happen and you know selling those trying to sell you you know even they were like selling it out of the trunk of his car because that was it's what made new line but new line cinema wasn't no. it was it was could have been you know bob's basement you know what i mean like <laughs> It turned into, they call it the house that Freddie built. Because, yeah. uh, now, you've had a chance to work with so many great directors. Uh, you know, when it comes to innovation, where would you put, like, Wes Craven in that list? Uh, was he, you know, very innovative compared to others we see on top of the list? I'd say he's definitely way up there, like, with, maybe like Lawrence Kasdan and those other like really brilliant writer directors that have created such classic films. I mean, I, I'm drawing a blank on directors names, but I would say Wes should and does, I'm sure live in the top 10 of those kind of just innovative. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that he, he did interesting in my opinion, also with Nightmare on Elm Street, it's, I actually, someone from, I, I was on, I, I don't know where, I think I was at a Comic Con and I was kind of listening to somebody's panel and it was, I think it was somebody from Blumhouse said that, that all great horror is, is intrinsically sad. Um, that and, and that's a great horror. Like you can make any kind of horror movie you want. And, and Wes, Wes is really when you break Nightmare on Elm Street down, it's about latchkey kids. Mm -hmm. It's we that we filmed that that was like the first generation that of divorce in the U.S. because people didn't used to get divorced in and mass, and so he was really making a commentary on that. This isn't my opinion. He actually said those things, mm -hmm. so it was like his commentary on and and I believe he was going through a divorce or had just gone through a divorce of of like how that harms children and you know and their how, how children could be so afraid. Uh, it's almost like, you know, a metaphor or something. So I think that also Nightmare on Elm Street is very sad, really. Like when you watch it, it's just sad. It's sad. All these kids are like lost and all they have is each other and nobody and, believes And they're that. dying for the sins of their parents. Yes. Yeah. Th that is very sad. Now, the same year you did the movie... You did some video shorts with, uh, you know, uh, uh, Freddy Krueger. Uh, how did that come about? Wait, what video shorts? Wait. Well, they're listed here. In fact, I've never heard of them until I started researching this. Oh. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street alternate endings. Happy ending and Freddy ending. Oh, those are. Okay. That was because I was like, wait a minute. What did I do? <laughs> um those were shot when we were filming Nightmare on Elm Street. Wes shot three or four different endings. Okay. And um, and he and I believe, I think Robert has told me this. I believe he, Wes and Bob Shea didn't agree on the ending. And now I can't remember who wanted what. And I'm not sure 
that that's the I can't remember if I, maybe Wes won out and that is the ending you wanted, but one of them didn't want the ending that was in the ultimate. Movie. Yeah, because there there was one like where, um, I don't I can't even remember what they are, but they're alternate endings okay. and. Yeah, and so, um, and I remember when we were filming them that also we didn't know which one they were going to pick. So it was kind of fun. So we couldn't, even if we wanted to, we couldn't um, give away the ending of the movie because we didn't, didn't know. know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, after doing A Nightmare on Elm Street, did your view on horror change and you decided to do more horror? You have a very nice spectrum of roles. You have done a little bit of everything. Yeah. Uh, did Nightmare on Elm Street change your view on doing horror going forward? Yeah, and do you want to know, I've literally never been offered another great role like that in a horror film. I've done, um, I, like, two... It, it, until the id came along which i loved that movie so much but i'd done some you know things that came along i did some for money i did some because i needed to get my health insurance and i needed to do those movies but they were never they weren't great experiences and they weren't they didn't they just they weren't of that level and and you know i would love to do some of the great horror tv series and movies that are being made now but Nobody has ever offered me, I mean, since Nightmare on Elm Street, a, a, a A-plus yeah. role like that. So um, I, I don't know if people just don't, you know, what I, I don't know the reason behind that. But I would totally love to do another really great horror film um, and, and ri get rid of the bad taste of the couple really bad films <laughs> that I did. Um, but um, until, but in twenty. 15 I think it was I did a movie called the id which was yes. a, another low budget movie but it was just such a great role and a good you know another horror film that was intrinsically sad and it was a commentary on caretakers and how hard it is you know people adults taking care of their parents when they're ailing and stuff and they, it was really good and um but that's it those are the two mm -hmm. that have ever come my way that um that I would love to do. Like, I mean, I would. Now, now personally, uh, when you're as a fan watching entertainment, uh, <laughs> do you, you know, every so often watch a horror movie or are you just not into the genre as a fan? I'm not as into it as a fan and not because I don't appreciate it. And I love the idea of it. I literally feel like I'm going to die because I don't know how to just go. I'm watching a movie. Like I, I get so scared that I'm too scared. And that if I was ever going to make a short film or because I can't, I don't know like how, how to make it would, it would, it's not enough of a story for a film, but of how, like I would about somebody just dying because they're so scared watching a horror film. Yeah. That's, that's what happens to me when I watch them where like Heather and Robert are like, oh, man, look at how they did that. Oh, that looks cool. What well, literally, wait, okay, true story. I went to the screening of a horror film that Heather Langenkamp did mm -hmm. called Home. I went with her. I was her date. And I inappropriately screamed <laughs> throughout the whole film to where people wanted me to leave the theater. <laughs> because literally someone would just reach for a coffee cup and I'd scream. And Heather was like... There's nothing happening. And I'm like, how do you know it's not? And then I, I would also be ruining the jump scare that was about to happen because I've screamed over somebody like grabbing coffee, you know, their sweater, <laughs> <laughs> just like everything scares me. And so I'm horrible to go to a horror movie with. And because I, I have seen a few, I saw the remake of Friday the 13th with Heather. She always drags me. And I screamed so much that somebody asked me to move and so i'm i'm terrible <laughs> i'm just too scared i'm gonna they're gonna i'm gonna have a heart attack watching them oh my god that's a funny funny story uh, <laughs> I, you... I literally scream so inappropriately at all the uh, the like where people are like and then people jump because they think something happened and then they're like she was just getting her coffee cup anyway. uh what is uh from doing Nightmare and doing a horror movie, was there any takeaways that you got from shooting a horror film? 
that you brought forward into some of your other characters? Well, you know, there's a couple things. I learned a couple, it's not tricks, but things that help tell a scary story. Like if, if some, if you're being like, if you're the woman that's being followed, mm -hmm. you, you, or, oh no, here's, oh, here's is better. Like say, like in Nightmare on Elm Street, like if, if I was on a catwalk and Freddie was down here, never look down because then the audience is like, look down, look down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or if the per if the scary thing is above you, you, you have to find an organic reason never to look up or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So that the audience, cause it builds. Make it realistic. And, yeah. Or like if somebody's following you, you know, you turn, but maybe don't turn all the way cause you're too afraid to turn around. So you just find ways to make it seem real and organic um and that helps build tension so i learned that from wes that's awesome um, now but but i was gonna say but what i it just re it reinforced in me as an actor like to just try to be as truthful as possible because i think the raw truth in say a nightmare on elm street or in the id which is what like kind of more my modern version of mm -hmm. almost like Tina, um is like that the more just you like unzip your own skin and kind of step into that world and help tell that story. Um, the more emotion the audience will feel or the more yeah. connected to you in the story, the audience will feel. So I, I feel like to me in a horror film that young, that was so good that it really reinforced that just being that honest as the character, because none of us were like, you know, it was obviously like we weren't like the, hot babe booby girl you know what i mean like we were like we look like you could we could have been i mean we i get we i was cute heather's beautiful but we were approachable beauties so i feel like that also helped like people feel connected because it, you aren't watching like two supermodels you know fight a monster um so it definitely added another dimension to your acting you know doing the I, horror I think so. I, I agree. I, I, I completely agree. Now, talking about The Ed, it's a psychological thriller. Your performance received a lot of praise uh, for The Id. some calling it a career-defining performance. Quote, um, how do those words affect you? I feel a little teary, I got to say. Um, <laughs> I just loved that role so much, and... Um, it was just such an honor to be gifted with it. And, and, um, I kind of thought of her as like, if, you know, like a damaged Tina had <laughs> grown up, she, they just had that same vulnerability. Both were fighters. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but it, that movie, I mean, I really gave that my all, um, and it was directed by the lovely Tommy Hudson, who I also have recorded some of his audio books. Like he's, um, he's, he's my knight, my, my, my writer, director in shining armor. Um, but that just makes me, it's pretty amazing to be appreciated well, for something that you did. And, and, you know, it doesn't always happen. So I feel, um, super grateful. I just always, I just feel so grateful. Here's how I see it. Your performance in the ed was, so in your subtle expressions, your demeanor, it feels like a culmination of a lifetime of acting experience. And like you said, you laid it all out there. And that's what led to such a beautiful performance. That's uh, the nicest thing to say. I don't you're mean to make so, you cry. I don't want to make people so, cry. Oh my God. I, I'm like crying like it's a Barbara Walters interview. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. That that no. means a lot to me. And I mean it. It's just uh, you know when it comes to acting, uh, I'm not an actor, obviously, so I don't know much about it. But I feel when you're watching someone in a role and you completely forget that it's a movie that you're watching, where you know the actor is not acting. That that's what you brought with the id, and that's what makes it so great, and that's what makes your performance uh so great now in with the id uh where does that sit in your heart 
you know, the movie itself, the performance, the overall experience. It's up there. It's in my top five experiences. And it, and it was not an easy experience. It was very low budget. It was a grueling shoot. We had an amazing crew. Um, and, you know, I just had to go to this place every day. And, and thank goodness we were on location so I didn't have to come home yeah. and be like, try to be normal because I definitely did not feel normal while we were filming that. So I got to just go to my hotel room and be weird. Um, but uh, the thing that I realized afterwards, it was about a month after we were filming, uh, we would wrap and my boyfriend at the time said, I think you need to let her go. Ooh. And I realized that I, I just, I still felt so heavy. And so I had like a little, it sounds so silly, but I had like a little ritual to be like, just like let her go. Cause I, 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 did, I, I don't know if I didn't want to let her go or you if it was attached. You get attached. Yeah, I got yeah. attached to her. And um, but yeah, Stephen was like, "You gotta let her go. It's a little heavy. It's a little heavy around here." <laughs> now I, I gotta ask you this: uh, Is there anything that you look for now in a script on whether you're even gonna decide to audition for it or not? Yes, I mean, okay. It depends on when you ask me. If, <laughs> if I haven't worked in a while, my bar is a lot lower <laughs> than when I'm feeling flush. Um, but obviously, I I like strong women. But I mean, even um, uh, Meredith in the ID. Uh, I mean, she was super vulnerable and fragile and all those things. But there was something about it was it was just such a strong character. Or a strong, and so I look for something that I would love something that tells a good story maybe has a nice moral or, you know, it doesn't have to be nice. Like, um, but you know, uh, it, it would just be nice if there was that it, it's especially like horror scripts when I've gotten them. And by the way, I don't ever get offered the ones that I want to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've already said that. I'm just going to keep saying that. Um, like where they have a great story and like the women are powerful or, um, victorious or there's a great moral about vanity yeah. or selfishness or you know what i mean like where you go oh this is it makes this... a statement it makes a statement about yeah current yeah. relevant events yeah like i things like that and and also like you know if the script makes sense it can be a good movie but i yeah. have been scripts that are just it doesn't make sense. And I think sometimes fil young filmmakers or inexperienced filmmakers think that they can somehow make a good movie from that. But if it's not on the page, it is not going to be on the screen. You exactly. know what I mean? Like exactly. it, it, it has to be in the, in the script. And, but, um, but really like, I just want to tell good stories and I don't care what genre they're in. And, and I want to play characters that, that I get to be challenged by as an actress, mm -hmm. but also maybe, help someone yeah. feel something like the id so so many people reached out to me after they saw it and talked about how they'd been taking care of an ailing parent and how that even in this weird horror film we helped capture some of the strain they felt mm -hmm. and you know so like you know what i mean so it can be any genre and and any thing i just would like to tell good stories you mm -hmm. know and just help tell good stories that makes perfect sense. We're almost out of time, but I do want to ask you this. Uh, back in the 80s, when streaming, the internet, all these streaming services were not around, every film was pretty much a studio film, and uh, independent films were not as relevant as they are today. If you wanted to make a film, you don't have the, uh, you know, the resources that you have today. And that leads yeah. me to my question. Uh, are you a supporter uh, and a fan of independent films uh, as a, you know, where you want to help them out as, in any way you can? Yes, 100%. Um, because I think the more voices telling stories, the better. And I think, you know, there's so many opportunities for people, you know, now, um, if, if they have a great script, they're, they're, they're able to actually make it themselves if they're, you know, 
I mean, just there's just so many great stories of that. Yes, I'm a hundred percent supporter of independent That's awesome. film. And I, I'm just I'm a fan of independent films and um and uh, and independent filmmakers. I just kinda like that kind of I don't know, it just I'm I got to do like what it came out at the beginning of quarantine. I did a western year before last that was a, a a little indie that turned out was like in the top 10 on Netflix yeah. for like a month. And, um, and he, uh, Justin Lee, who wrote and directed that is, is making really cool indie films. Um, I've done two of his and I, I'm super grateful that I get to work with creators like that, that like can make things like and being innovative with no money and getting really good actors together. And I just, you know, you go, wow, this is cool. I'm so excited to be a part of that. I know I said that was my last question, but I actually have one more. Do, uh, are you still doing conventions and appearances and whatnot? Or has that stopped? I haven't done any since 2019. Well, because um, of, yeah, I, of COVID, obviously. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people have been going to them. I just, um, I haven't. But I, I'm hoping to go maybe next year. Because I really feel, I really like meeting people and I like interacting with your fans. Yeah. And I love hearing everybody's stories and, and, um, I, it always just makes you feel, I feel, it just reminds me again, how grateful I am. And it's, it's, so I'm hoping I get to go next year a couple of times. Absolutely. And I would love, I, I go to a lot of cons and cover them and hopefully one day I'll get to meet you there because you're an absolutely amazing person. This has been an amazing hour. It just flew by. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Uh, I grew up watching you on the screen and better off dead in nightmare on elm street and fast times at ridgemont high uh you know in 84 i was 10 in 82 i was eight i mean so i literally grew up watching you on the screen and if you would have told me back then that you know 30 plus years later i'd be talking to you i'd be like you must be high and i got to (laughs) talk to you and it's been an absolute honor thank you so much any final thoughts you want to share well, first of all, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And I, too, hope we get to meet in person Absolutely. maybe next year. And yeah. you just made me blush. And you're you're lovely. And um, just I just hope everybody stays well. And um, I, everybody that's listening, I, I hope that everybody's finding their way through this crazy time mm-hmm. with, with, you know, their – themselves intact and moving forward hopefully to something exciting i really wish everyone lots of love and um good fortune going forward because um i think we all need it right now yeah we're living in a crazy world i cannot agree with you uh any more than that uh thank you to amanda wiss thank you to all our viewers it's been a great hour uh stay safe and until next time on behalf of amanda and myself stay walking good night good night